Hey, good morning. It's great to see y'all. Man, packed house in July. It's just so good to have everybody together. So good to worship the Lord. We're back from Africa. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I won't show you a, a slideshow of the whole trip, but, but sort of, but not quite. Um, pretty hyped to be here today. Um, before I dive in, though, I, I've got I've to say this just as your pastor. We've had quite a week, um, the reversal of Roe v. Wade, that whole thing, um, as if, you know, there aren't other things going on in the world. It's just like one thing after another. But, man, um, if you're like me, uh, pro-life, uh, really all my life, if you will, I believe that God is pro-life. Um, but I have talked to a lot of people, I have, you know, varied friend, friend groups and, and people even in our church uh, have different opinions about this thing. And the thing that I want to say to all of our guests who are here, you need to hear this. Our, our, our members would know this mostly, but we, we are pro-life for all of life. This is really important to understand. We're not just pro-birth. We're pro-life. And the way of Jesus means that we are pro-life from the womb to the tomb. Because I've talked to some, some women who feel really vulnerable here in this thing. I mean, I've heard from some who, who think this decision is terrifying, is, is how they describe it. And I, I, there's a lot of debate and all the stuff, and everybody has different opinions about this. But we've got to always, something like this, instead of gloating over some decision, you know, saw some Christians doing that, we ought to lead with empathy and with love, seeking understanding with others. And I'm saying that because it's time for us as a church, more than ever before, though it's continuing, this is not new for us, to, to dive headlong into ministries here in our city where we can help vulnerable women. Gosh, babies, yes, and fathers and mothers, and we like Thrive Ministry or, or a Brother Bill's or when I think of Healing Hands, all these different ministries that we're a part of, young lives. I mean, this is something that we've been a part of, helping young moms or women who uh, become pregnant out of wedlock. We want to be that church, amen? We want to be that kind of church. And so if, I, I don't know if that distinguishes us. It does from some, I know that, but, but that's who we are. Just wanted to say that uh, from the start. There's much more that can be said, and we'll, we'll talk about ways to get involved, but you know, it's, we do more than vote is the point, or it just rings hollow. Um, we're not doing, we're not following the way of Jesus if we're not caring hands-on, you know, close proximity to people in need. And so you'll hear more about ministries that we're part of. If you want to dive in, go online and you can find ways to serve. Uh, reach out to us. We'd love to help. Okay. So get and grab your Bible. We're in Matthew, as, as um, Han noted. If you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew. If not, you'll see the, the uh, we're kind of, um, enabling you, or the scripture is going to be on the screen, but bring your Bible. I always say it to this course, always the text for this course. Uh, we're going to dive in to one of the greatest stories in the whole Bible. This is one of my favorite stories. Now I'm usually pretty hyped about, you know, the words of Jesus, but this story is transformative. And we are praying as Rebecca prayed that it's going to change your life. Um, some of you heard me tell this story. Um, some years ago, Stacy and I were at a wedding rehearsal dinner. And we're sitting there, and I'm talking to this gal I just met sitting beside me, young uh, student, and um, she's 20-something, mid-20s, 30 maybe. And, I, and she was in school, and I said, wow, what are you studying? And she said, well, I'm, I'm getting my doctorate in mathematics. And I was like, wow, that's, that's impressive. Never been real good with numbers. That's amazing. And she said, oh, we don't use numbers anymore. I mean, I, I was like, I don't even, I think I said something like, well, hey, how about them cowboys? I mean, let's, <laughs> let's go. I, I was like, I don't even know what to say. It's like, this is, wait, math without numbers. It's like reading without words, right? It's like words without letters. What is this? I'm like, I don't get it. Just don't get it. Sometimes you just don't get it. I don't even have, like even this issue, the, you know, Roe v. Wade or some other issues, gun reform or whatever else, you have friends even in your own family or people like, like you thought were like really intelligent and they're on the completely opposite side of you. Like I thought you were like, I don't get it. Sometimes you just don't get it, right? 
Uh, some of you have seen there, there's these classic images, they're ambiguous images that, that I, want you to, I want you to see. Almost like a little psychology test, see if you can figure this out. But, um, but like this one, look on the screen here. Um, do you see a, a, a rabbit or, or a duck? Which do you see there? Okay. That one's kind of easy. How many of y'all see both? We see both. All right. Okay. Y'all are geniuses. I, you know, I don't know. No, that one's easy. Okay. Here's, a, here's an old, like old classic one. Do you see an old lady, old woman looking down or a young woman turning her head away? Anybody see that? Okay. This one. This one's kind of, kind of easier to see silhouettes um, of two people, you know, either talking or three columns side by side. Right. And this one's kind of fun. This one is kind of fun. Face of a woman. Or a dude playing a sax. Like, what do you see? <laughs> and some of you are going, I don't. And some of you are like, do you see that? I don't see it. Um, you either get it or you don't. Those are kind of simple, but um, you either get it. Now, if you get it, you like forever get it. Like, I got it. I can't unsee that now. Or it's like, I just don't. I don't know. And the same is true with some of the most important theological truths that, that we can ever know. This past week, I said, you know, we got back from, from Africa this week, and it was a wild, wild and crazy uh, trip, but amazing. Um, and I want I to set up the sermon a bit by, by sharing a um, story ultimately, but I want you to just celebrate with me. We were with uh, Dr. Bowman, Brad Bowman, some of you know, is a deacon in our church, leader in our church. He's been connected with the Lighthouse for Christ for a long time, for, for decades, really. And um, he and a group of doctors, well, a partner of his, Dr. Godfrey, we took some nurses. We had other nurses, medical teams that were with us. And, um, and uh, his wife, Angela, some of y'all know uh, Angela as well. But Dr. Bowman was able to do um, cornea transplants, like literally took frozen cornea tran- corneas, 17 cornea transplants. And as we've noted, um, if you're new here, I mean, it's amazing stuff. Like you come in, a patient comes in not seeing, leaves seeing is what happens. And all of this to present the gospel at the lighthouse for Christ. We took a group of our, of our own, um, you know, nurses and, and again, teams. We, uh, we were a part of a, um, of a, of a, of a church build. Uh, we actually literally built this church. The lighthouse for Christ has planted about a hundred churches this one was a couple of hours away from where we were working every day. We did a big um, soccer camp while we were there. Uh, Grant Glover on our staff, myself, did a pastor's conference. These are some of the leaders. We had about 100 pastors from all over Kenya who came. One guy came 11 hours, and they would sleep then on the floor of a sanctuary, one room sanctuary that would maybe seat about 200 people if you had a bunch of kids with you. But um, it was amazing. But my point in just celebrating with you all that God did is, is to say this. Among these pastors, we went into it, and our whole intention was this is going to be a gospel-centered pastor's conference. Really getting to the heart of the gospel and really getting underneath the gospel, understanding the gospel. What is gospel-centered preaching? What does a gospel-centered church look like? What does gospel-centered life look like? What is all this? So we were unpacking the gospel, doing some real... Um, uh, basic, you could say, theological training. These, a lot of these pastors have been trained, but there's limited, you can imagine, very little training um, outside the global West, frankly. A real heart and passion that we have here is to help pastors around the world. So um, we're, we're doing this. And, and what we realized was that even among pastors, uh, we realized what a global challenge this is, that many of us just don't get it. We don't get it. I'm not, I'm not coming at this from a prideful standpoint. I'm just saying it's so simple for us to see the very core theological doctrines, dogma, I would call them, the core that doesn't change by definition, how we get off of it and we move away from it. We're so prone to do so that today what I want to do, and we do this all the time. If you're, if you're a guest, you need to know this is it. I got one message. I'm sticking to it. The grace of God. That's all we've got. And it is transformative. And so today we're going to look at a story that Jesus tells, the most, one of the most confounding stories in all the Bible. It's in Matthew chapter 20. So go ahead and turn there, Matthew 20. It's a parable where Jesus has been talking, uh, or the way Matthew sets this up. He, um, he's just told the story of the rich young ruler, which ends with, um, so the first will be last and the last 
shall be first. It's kind of how this, this story ends. And then he kicked into this story. Listen to it. Some of you have heard this story. Let it make you crazy once again. Verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay, like a lot of parables start out. That's usually what the parables are about. The kingdom of heaven. Which we've done a lot of talking about, by the way, over the past several months. Jesus, the king, and his kingdom. That's our focus. Is like a master. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, that's a day's wage, it was common, he sent them into his vineyard. Now this story, the image here is not so far removed. 2,000 years later, you can go to places all around the Metroplex, around DFW, and find groups of people ready to serve, ready, to, ready for work. Um, if you go to Jack Lowe Elementary very often, you go right by, what is that, Shady Brook? You go right there like you're going to the school, um, and you'll see groups of men, generally, who are there ready to work from early morning, and then they're there midday, and they're still there in the afternoon. So this is not too far removed for us. It's important to know, uh, in the context here, work, the work day was 6 to 6, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and, uh, and it was broken down into four three-hour time slots. So the owner says he'll pay them a day's wage denarius work, so, um, for a day's work. So uh, verse 3. And going out about the third hour, so this is 9 o'clock, okay? 6 was 0. So we go 9 o'clock. He saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too. And whatever's right, I'll give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour. So what time? This is noon. All right. Then the ninth hour is three in the afternoon. He did the same. And then look at verse six. And about the eleventh hour. So what time is this? Five, Five o'clock in the afternoon. We're only going to six. Got one hour. He went out and found others standing. And he said to them, hey, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one's hired us. There seems to be like good intention. We want to be hired. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. He's giving them all work. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages. Beginning, look how this story's crafted. Beginning with the last up to the first. The one hour guy first and then let's go. And then it says in verse nine, when those hired about the 11th hour, okay, five o'clock came, each one of them received a denarius. Yes. A full day's wage. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. Understandably, right? Been out uh, six to six, working hard in the sun. But each of them also received the denarius a day's wage, just like the other guys. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, imagine, saying, these last uh, worked only one hour, and you have made them, operative phrase, you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you, have, or do you begrudge my generosity? The, the word in the Greek, literally, do you have an evil eye? Do you have an envious eye is what he's saying. Do you envy them? So the last will be first and the first last. Imagine being an original hearer. Some of you have heard this story before. But we would join, don't we? We join collectively all of the all-day workers along with every, and every parent has heard this, from if you have kids who have siblings and we all cry out together, that's not fair. That's not fair. That is not fair. This is not how it's supposed to go. But look, notice again, it started out with the kingdom of heaven is like. So in our economy, that's not fair. The way we measure compensation, work and wages, that's not fair. In the kingdom of heaven, something else is going on. Because God, the vineyard owner, okay, is how this is playing out. He's not a very good businessman. 
because he's not a businessman. He's king. He's the ruler. He's over all of it. And so we see, we've already learned like a couple of weeks ago, we learned that two plus five equals 5,000 plus. If you've been with us, this is some kind of new math. Math without numbers, this is mind-blowing. And what I want to do here is talk about how, who it is that doesn't get it, all right? Who gets it and how to get it, okay? So all of us. Let's start with who doesn't get us. Here's the problem with the parable. Why do we join the all-day laborers and say it's not fair? Why do we react to this story? Jesus, the master storyteller, hooks us in because he knows the condition of the human heart. He tells this story, he hooks us in because he knows our pride and he knows our sin. You know why we don't like this story? Why it's so confusing? Because we identify with the wrong people. We think we're first hour workers. That's why we're messed up. And Jesus, look what he did, savage Jesus. He tells this story and we're like, ah. Oh. See, every now and then you read the Bible, if you read it rightly, you read the Bible and you go, this is about me. This is about me. But, and, and, but if, we're, if we're not careful, we read the Bible and we even teach our kids. And this, everybody who works with kids and everybody who has kids, listen. If we read the Bible, uh, be like David. Like David slay Goliath. You know, slay. And if you go, if, if you get your theology from TikTok or Instagram or somewhere, you slay, you slay all day. Just slay. Go, get, go knock down the giants. Go after them. Go kill the giants until they kill you. Then what do you do? Because that's life. That's real life. Uh, be like Moses. You know, be, be courageous like Esther. Be, and if, if all we do is teach our kids that when you read the Bible, work harder, get better, be like that because you're messed up, get your act together. If we're not careful, that's what we teach. And that is not the gospel. That's not Christianity. That's a religion that bears the name of Christ. That's not the point of the gospel, as we'll see today. Because think about it. Be like David. Be like which, which David? David was a murderer. He was an adulterer. Be like Moses. Moses was a murderer. Moses was, he lost his temper. Be like Abraham. Liar. Right? My point is this. We're not the hero of this story. We're not the hero of the Bible. Neither are any one, any, any person, any story in the Bible. Not about the heroes of our faith. There are those. Good examples. I get it. God is the hero of the Bible. Jesus is the hero of the story, and he's the hero of your life and mine. We are not the heroes of our own story. This runs counter to what the world wants to tell you. The secular schema is you are the hero of your story. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Work hard. Slay all day. That is not the way life goes, is it? Let's be honest. That's, we, we, need, we need a hero. We need a savior is what we need. And that's what this story is about. See, day-long laborers don't get it because of their pride. And in the same way, we don't. Because we think we're all-day workers. We're bringing something to the table, are we not? Here's the first thing I want you to see. And if you take notes, you can write this down. The kingdom of God is not about being first or last. It's about not counting at all. It's not about being first. And it's not about being last. It's about not counting this is, a, this is a completely different mindset. Those of us who don't get it are those who are striving to achieve salvation. And we all do this in varying degrees. And we'll see it even after. Even as Christians, we do this. Those of us who don't get it are never free from the burden of being good enough. And many of us live this way with a constant kind of low-grade um, understanding or thought that God is just mildly upset with us all the time. And so many believers live this way because we think we're not doing enough. We're not working hard enough. How would you know? How would you know? Let's, let's, I'm just going to allow the Spirit to speak um, into your life. You're, you're legalistic. You're critical. 
of other people. Holding others to high standards that you can't even, you can't even live up to. You're judgmental. You're still counting. You're finding fault in other people. You're prideful. You, you feel like you're, well, hey, I get it. Others don't get it. I've wrestled with this, full disclosure, this week. Like, how crazy is this? Your pastor, sorry. Um, well, I, I mean, I really get grace. I really think I get grace. A lot of people don't get grace, but I get it. A lot of people don't get it. How jacked up is that? I've become a Pharisee because of grace. That's how prideful and sinful I am. This is nuts. We all fall into it. How would you know? You're a consumer. You're grumbling. You, 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 you know, constantly seeking to determine your own worth by your own, by the approval of others, by the work that you do, comparing, again, finding fault. Life is not fair. You live with a sense of entitlement. This describe any of us? And, and, and again, this is not just preacher man coming at you. This is all of us. See, the irreligious person, the non-religious person is constantly, in the secular schema, always trying to prove themselves by the work they do, right? By the stuff we have, the job I get, got to work harder, get better, get the approvals, the likes, whatever else. How else would you determine your worth? Apart from Christ. How else would you do that? And then watch this. The religious person does the same thing. Christians do the same thing. We just have a different scorecard. And, and we just kind of put Christ's name on it. We all tend to do this. So we're all kind of trapped in this thing. But because theology matters so much, we don't get it because we're prideful. But let's talk about who gets it. Let's turn the corner a little bit. Who gets it? If the first hour workers don't get it, the last hour worker, you could say, maybe he gets it. Like he's just, you know, because all of us would say this is not fair. The last hour worker is going, he might go, not fair, but hey, you know, this is awesome. I got to go tell other people to work for this guy because you don't have to do anything. It's amazing. And we even listen to that. We hear that when like a slackered, you got to be working hard. We'll get to that. Because what we see here is the theological truth that has got to be grasped. One of the things that we did in one of our sessions um, with the pastors at, at the conference, we started to get a sense of where the Spirit was leading and what we needed to teach and, and all the stuff. We went well prepared, but we, we made some shifts along the way. One of them was uh, this slide. We showed this slide. Now, it's translated in, into Swahili. But, um, but I want to ask you, are humans born first three options, morally good, or secondly, um, morally neutral, like we, 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 you know, good and bad. Like we have that capacity to go one way or the other. Um, or we morally, morally bad. Which is it? I wonder where you would, I wonder where you would land there. And because theology matters so much, this is important to note because only one of these options explains what the Bible teaches. Only one of these options describes what the reformers called total depravity. Only one of these options necessitates the cross. Only one of these options reveals what Romans 1, Romans 3, the entire book of Romans, the whole Bible teaches us. We are morally bankrupt, morally corrupt. Every single one of us. We, we don't bring anything to the table. In fact, some of you know Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. Meaning even our best acts are mixed up with impure motives and sinful intent. And you're thinking, well, thanks, Jeff. Um, this is great news. This is the truth. This is why we struggle with this story. We want to bring something to the table. Surely I bring something. You bring your sin that makes the cross necessary. That's what you bring. That's all you bring. And friends, we've got to get this right. If this is troubling for you and it's pushing against your pride, like I think I bring something. Do I not bring something to it? 
If you think so, you don't get it. And it's why you're constantly thinking, I can bring something to the table. So do good works matter at all? This is where we make the shift. Because the kingdom of God presents a third way. It's always the third way. Let's talk about how to get it. All right? We said that the first challenge is Jesus reels us in. Because of our sin, our pride, he, he, he says, yeah, you think you're the all-day worker and you're not. Now, Tim Keller says that religion operates on this principle. He got this from uh, really Luther, others, Martin Luther. But it, it says this. Religion says this. I obey, therefore I'm accepted by God. Right? That's religion. The all-day workers think that they should be given more because they've worked so hard. But here's what the Bible teaches us. This parable shows us. God doesn't need profit from us. God doesn't need your good works. He doesn't benefit from your working all day out in the heat. He gets nothing from you as a result of that. You say, that's troubling. Why do I work at all? Let's get to it. See, he doesn't benefit. But the basic, here's it, the basic operating principle of the gospel is this. I'm accepted by God through the work of Christ, therefore I obey. Those are two radically different stories. Now, if you've been around here long enough, you're going, Jeff, heard this, heard this. I hope so. This is the message. This is all we've got. The message of grace is what we're all about here as a church. Again, if you're a guest, this is what we preach and teach because the gospel changes everything. Grace changes everything. This is what motivates us to worship him. We get a new relationship with God, a new identity because of Christ. We are the last, <laughs> we're the last hour workers. We know that we are. We don't get it. We don't bring anything to the table. Christ has done it all. And, and so what happens is we realize it's all grace. It's all grace. And what he's saying, Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God is not about earning wages, it's about dispensing gifts. This is why the vineyard owner can say, can I not do whatever I want to do? I'm the grace giver. You got nothing, but I'm the one bringing it. See, grace is what brings about justification. There's another theological word. We've got to get our minds around. Because we're justified before God, not because of our good works, but because of what Christ has done for us. His good works, right, for us, and so now he comes not as just our good example, but as our substitute, different ball game altogether. He's our substitute. He lives the perfect life. He dies on the cross for our sin. He's the all day worker. He works perfectly all day long on our behalf. We receive it. We get the day's wage. We get eternal life in him. This is the gospel message. And if you understand you don't get it, you don't bring anything to it, you get it. This is why Martin Luther, the great reformer, he brings this fundamental insight when he said that religion is the default mode of the human heart. See, and I don't know how you translate default mode from 1500, but, um, but, it, but it's translated that way. He, he says, it's like us today. He would not have understood this, but your computer has a has an automatic def default mode, right? Unless you go in and deliberately tell it something else, it's going to kick in to that default mode. In the same way, even after, this is the, the point that Luther makes, even after you are converted by the gospel, your heart will still go back to the old operating system. Anybody? This is the constant challenge of the Christian life. In my life, to remain in him, the in him doctrine, dogma, that we are in Christ, that he is he's covering us in his righteousness. That is where I want to stay. Not that we lose our salvation. Because watch this. Justification is immediate and one time and instantaneous. It's unilateral love from God. Grace is unilateral. In other words, grace is one way love. We don't bring anything to the table. It's all God. It's the, vineyard, it's the vineyard owner who says, can't I do whatever I want? Because I'm the one bringing grace. I'm the one paying. I'm, I'm dispensing gifts. I'm the one giving out gifts of grace. 
And, and, and friends, I'm telling you, the, the Christian life is constantly remaining in that. And so what, what Luther's getting at is we've got to repeatedly, deliberately keep going back to gospel mode over and over again all day long. Because you're going to forget. You're going to forget this afternoon. You're going to start getting the Sunday scaries. You're going to start to think about Monday. And what's going to happen is you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I've got to perform well. I've got to make sure I'm doing the right thing. And, oh, my gosh. And then this self-condemnation starts coming in. Listen, self-condemnation needs to end in your life. Romans 8, 1, you know, tells us that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So here's the thing. It seems to me now the work has begun. So motivated by this new truth, new grace, new identity, new motivation for obedience altogether. What's happening here is this. Listen, theological terms. Again, theology matters. Jesus has taken us to school on justification and sanctification. Justification means, again, I've been justified, made right before a holy God because of Jesus. Sanctification is then appropriating that grace in my life to become like Christ by being obedient, working with him. Justification is objective. It's one time. It's instantaneous based on what God has done for you in Christ, not what you've done, to receive it by faith, not works, and then sanctification is to say, I am going to now respond to that grace to become just like Jesus because that's where the joy is found. That's why he's rescued me. I'd say it this way. Here's the problem with many of us. We turn our sanctification into our justification. Are you following me? We want to add to, and over time, we tend to think, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a Christian. I get it. They don't. That becomes pride, judgmental attitude, and an unloving spirit because we think we brought something. Theologian Richard Lovelace wrote this. This is a little longer quote than normal, but listen to this. Only a fraction of the present body of professing Christians are solidly appropriating the justifying work of Christ in their lives. In their day-to-day -day existence, they rely on their sanctification for justification. Few know enough to start each day with a thoroughgoing stand upon Luther's plat platform. You are accepted, looking outward in faith, and claiming, this is what Luther said, the holy alien righteousness of Christ as the only ground for acceptance. And then he says, relaxing, I love this, relaxing in that quality of trust, which will produce increasing sanctification as faith is active in love and gratitude. What is he saying here? In other words, sanctification, becoming like Christ, is a response to his love for us. His love is not a response to our sanctification. He's done all the work necessary. He is our substitute. Justification is the declared act of righteousness. Have you received his grace? That's an act on your part. Receiving by faith justification, which is objective and unilateral. It comes to you from God. It's one way love. Sanctification is subjective. It's the process by which we partner with God to become like Jesus. Justification is complete. It's total. It's immediate. Sanctification is progressive. And it's a lifelong process. These two doctrines are distinct, but they are inseparable. Because think about this. God does not, how crazy would it be? He does not justify someone he's not going to sanctify. Or sanctify someone he's not going to glorify. This is what Paul meant when he said in first, uh, you know, Philippians 1, verse 6, he who began a good work in you, anybody know, is faithful to what? Complete it. It's going to happen. Will you work with him? Will you experience the joy of your salvation by, by never graduating from grace or from the gospel? There's no deeper things to graduate to.
There's no greater understanding than getting our minds and our hearts around this because sanctification gets its traction from the positive energy of our justification. I'd say it this way. Justification, grace alone, brings pure animation to our sanctification. Otherwise, you're doing it for some other reason. Are you with me? Is your mind blown? Can somebody say amen? Amen. This is the gospel. Confusing these two. We we can't confuse justification and sanctification. Confusing them will in the end undermine the gospel and turn our justification by faith into justification by performance. You see? So many Christians don't get this. And friends, I'm telling you, this will set you free. This is why I say all of life is an act of worship, response to what God's done, and why we can love others without any need for love in return because all the love we need we have found in him. This is how we're to live our lives. Do you live this way? See, the work is not done. The work has just begun because God is doing this thing in us. But the banner over us always, listen, as you go into this week, don't forget it. The banner over your life, if you have received Christ, if you haven't, this is not true. If you have, the banner of your life is it is finished. It's finished. So you can relax. You can live at peace in him, knowing that you're totally forgiven, fully loved. All of this is substitutionary. See, here's the crazy message of the gospel. You're more sinful than you've ever imagined. And more loved than you've ever dreamed. At the same time. That is the message of grace. And that is our story. And we're sticking to it. Amen? Some of you have heard, and I'll close with this. To be justified means that it's just as if I'd, what, anybody? Never Never sinned. It's a great definition, by the way. But you know what I think plays better? People like me. Prideful church going pastor guy. Just as if I'd always obeyed. Christ is the full day worker. He's performed perfectly for us. And he's done it for you. And if you think you're bringing a little something to the table, let's talk about the last second worker. Let's talk about the man on the cross. The thief on the cross who did nothing. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because of faith, not by works. It's confounding. Praise him for it. So here's the question I have for you before we pray. Now that you don't need to do a thing, what will you do? Ponder that all day long. Ponder it all week long. Now that you can't bring anything to the table, now that it's all grace and nothing but grace, what will you do? Because whatever you do, it will not be to appease a holy God. It won't be to get points in heaven. It won't be so that you're better than everybody else. That's works, that's religion, that's not the gospel, that's not Christianity. The gospel is, he's come, died on the cross for you, lived the perfect life for you, all day worker, Jesus. And he gives you that gift of his life, his perfect account to your account to be justified before holy God. Then to be set free, to live without the restraints of God bondage, the chains of trying to be good enough, and just to love him and love others, that is life. Now that you don't need to do a thing, what will you do? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit will lead each person to answer that question. Thank you that um, you're not a slave master. You're a father. You're a good father. And for those of us who've received your grace, we are your children. 
But right now, friends, in this moment, everybody, every head bowed and eye closed, you've got to get this right. If you've never received Christ, you've never received his grace, you've never fully understood the gospel until today, now's your time, right now, to say yes to him. By faith. This is what trips most of us up. We want to bring our intelligence. We want to bring our work. We want to bring some. But by faith, not works, you can receive him now to say, Lord, I believe. I believe. Take the mess of my life and forgive me. I'm sorry for how I have thought I am a part of the equation here. And it's all you. So, Lord, I give you my life. And, friend, maybe you've never done this. Lord, I receive your gift of salvation, the grace that you've given me, your punishment upon the cross for my sin. I receive it now. And I give you my life in response as an act of worship. Lord, we love you. We determine now to worship you everything we are. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen.